Praise the Lord, everyone. Amen. All right, we are going to be going into the Word of God here momentarily. I would like to sing another chorus as we do. We are going to be turning in our Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 22. And just for a few verses there, and then we'll be going elsewhere in the Scripture as the Lord leads us. Praise God. That's the way I like it, by the leading of the Spirit. It's a special service today, too. We have a baptism. We have a very, very, uh, uh, I think a very nice young man, put it that way. Just, I got to know him just yesterday. I had a phone call Friday night from Robert out in Washington, and of course, he and Brian and Deborah work with what we call the Last Trumpet Ministries Outpost, and that is putting our messages on the computer, and then they have a, uh, what do you call it, a chat room or something like that, where they, they talk together and they're reaching out, and the Lord is calling people in through it. Amen. And so we have a young airline pilot here. He flies the big 757s to Hawaii and back, and uh, he's living in Arizona right now. He's from New York. And uh, Savio, we're glad to have you. God bless you. Amen. He came in to get baptized in Jesus' name, all the way from Arizona. Amen. I didn't know about it until Friday night. Then I talked with him yesterday. So some things can happen. Isn't it amazing? You get on the telephone, you talk to somebody thousands of miles away, and then you know, later that day they're there. It's, it's, it's just uh, quite a thing. So we are reaching out to people, and God is honoring that. I'm so thankful for every soul that will answer that call of God. Amen. We're going to sing a chorus about faith. We sing it often. We're going to sing it yet again this morning. Keep on walking by faith. Amen. Keep on walking by faith. Just keep on walking by faith. I know he won't deny me. He's walking right beside me. Keep on walking by faith. Just keep on walking by faith. Just keep on walking by faith. I know he won't deny me. He's walking right beside me. Keep on walking by faith. One more time. Just keep on walking by faith. Just keep on walking by faith. I know he won't deny me. He's walking right beside me. Keep on walking by faith. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a praise. Well, praise the Lord. I should briefly mention also that we have two more baptisms Wednesday night. We have some people coming in from Montana, and they'll be uh, flying in on Tuesday. And uh, also we have uh, Brooke and David Staten and their family moving in here. They, they rented an apartment, and they're moving in on Tuesday. And then on the 16th of June, we have a family from New Jersey moving here. They bought a house in Juneau, not too far from here. So all kinds of things happening here lately. We have a lot of people to reach out to. There's a great work that must be done. Amen. And I hope that you will, and I believe that you will be praying, because only one thing matters, and that is souls are ready when the sky bursts open and the last trumpet sounds. Praise God. That's our only reason for being here. We're not trying to make a name for ourselves or build some big empire uh, not in the least. That's not our purpose and never could be. We are here to reach out to the lost. Success is measured in one soul saved. Amen. One soul brought out of darkness and into the marvelous light of God. I rejoice over that. Some people say I couldn't be happy unless I had 500 people. I want to see one come truly to God and I'll rejoice because the Bible tells us that in heaven there's rejoicing when one sinner comes to repentance. Amen. It's not about attendance. It's about true conversion and salvation. Well, anyway, that's the way I feel about it, and I believe I have the mind of God on that. So we're going to open our Bibles together to the book of Luke, chapter 22, beginning with the 31st verse. 
And we're just reading a few verses here as we move on in the scripture, but I'd like to bring a title and an opening thought with these verses. And we're going to title the message, I'll give you that before we, we read, The Sifting of Satan. The Sifting of Satan. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, says his name twice to arrest his attention and to let him know that what he is about to say is absolutely set in heaven. It cannot be changed or altered. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But, oh, thank God for that. But, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, oh, now look at that, he wasn't converted yet. But he walked with the Lord three and a half years. He saw miracles. He saw the dead raised. He believed, but he was not yet converted. Do you realize how many people are sitting in churches today that are not converted? There are churches full of people. There are auditoriums full of people by the thousands that do not know the Lord. They have not been converted. They're still as they were. They're interested for one reason or another, perhaps even Christian-minded or Christianized, but they are not converted. And so the Word of God tells us, when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. And so we look at the word of God today, and we Focus in on a scripture verse, and before we do that, before we begin to elaborate on this and see what the Lord's going to do with it, we would like to pray one more time and ask that God would lead us in his word because I can do nothing without him, and you can't hear without him, and so we do need him, all of us. Father in heaven, we humbly come to thy throne, O Lord, because we are absolutely helpless without thee. But Lord, we know that thy word is true and that thou hast thy word for us because we know that blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. So Lord, we know that thou art faithful and we beseech thee now that thou wouldst bring forth thy word that we might hear and believe and receive and obey. Let thy perfect will be done, O Lord. Strengthen our faith exceedingly. Let our ears not be dulled by the things of this world, nor any hindrance. For taking the authority of thy name and the power of thy saving blood, I now come against every devil, every unclean spirit, every force of darkness, every hindering power, breaking every hex, vex, and curse, and everything that would be sent against thy word, thy people, and thy kingdom to withstand thy purpose. Lord, I pray that thou wouldst have the preeminence that the power of the blood of Jesus would be applied to us and would prevail in us, that thy word would work mightily in us, O God, that thou wouldst give us victory in Jesus' name through the power of the blood. Help us now by thy spirit to hear thy word. And in Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Glory to God. Now we're ready. All right. We look at one verse in particular where Jesus said in verse 31, of Luke 22. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you. Satan wanted Peter. He desired to have him. And for what purpose? That he may sift you as wheat. And of course, we Think of the word sift, we often think of a flour sifter. I used to watch my mother, she baked a lot, and that's why I still look like this. But uh, she used to sift the wheat and turn the little crank in the thing and the flour would come through and it would take, separate the, the uh, big particles from the small particles and so forth. And basically the, 
The word sift really means to take apart and to closely scrutinize and examine. It's another meaning of the word. Now in the light of that, when you look at what's being said here by the Lord Jesus, Satan not only desired to have Peter, but Peter reminded us, and he was saying this from experience, he said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. So what the Apostle Peter is doing is he's saying, he's saying, this was not exclusive to me. But it's true of all of us, Satan would desire to have you. And his purpose is to sift you as wheat, in other words, to take your life apart. To scrutinize you, to watch you, to disassemble any faith that was built up in you, and all of the true doctrine of God, anything that's there, it is Satan's desire to take that apart and to tear you down. Now, he's gone into religions and into churches that at one time had at least some degree of truth. He's completely disassembled them using all of his devices. And, of course, the Apostle Paul said, we're not ignorant of those devices. We know about that. Amen. The devil has come along and he's told churches, there are no spiritual gifts anymore. All you have to do is know. I got news for you. The Bible doesn't say we know our way into heaven. The Bible does tell us that, that there is a way into Jesus Christ. And what does the scripture say? We don't believe into Christ. The Bible says we are baptized into Jesus Christ. Not a church, not a religion, baptized into Christ. The devil says, okay, well, that's well and good. Then go ahead and get baptized. But just make sure you don't say any name. See, don't say the name. And Scripture tells us in Acts 4.12, for neither is there salvation in any... In what? Salvation? That word salvation? Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Saved how? By being baptized into Christ. Not into the Catholic Church. That's a doorway to hell. But the word of God tells us that we come out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are called out of that. And baptism is not some little unimportant thing that's just some kind. The Bible says baptism is the answer of a good conscience toward God. How do you get a good conscience toward God? You repent of your sins. You die to yourself. You pour yourself out in repentance. And the Bible tells us God is nigh unto those that are of a broken heart and saveth such as be of a contrite spirit. So this is important, very, very important. And I had a little discussion one time with this woman. Her father was a minister, and, and uh, she said she was making uh, light of baptism. So I don't know how she got started on it. She was a co-worker when I was at the university. And I don't know how she got started on it, but she said, well, baptism, that's nothing. And I said, wait a minute, Carol. I said, the Bible tells us that it's a command. Now, if it's a command... In Acts chapter 10, it was commanded, right? The household of Cornelius. Then he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. If it's a command, it's important. But you see, people are in kind of this, this fog area. Because of religion, they're, they're uh, in some kind of a twilight zone, as it were. They, they don't really understand, and they don't think. We have to get into the Word of God, and I believe we have the Word of God, and I believe the King James Bible is God's Word and doesn't need any editing. God has no proofreader. And when men come along and say, it should have said this, or it's weak on that, or it should be that, no, 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 no. This book is bigger than you are, and don't forget it. And every word is correct. It has no errors. If you think it does then you become God's editor. I've seen this book work. I've seen the other ones fail. Amen. I've seen devils cast out by the authority of the King James Bible. I've heard devils laugh at the NIV. All right? So there is a difference. 
I believe this book is bigger than you and I, bigger than all of us, and I don't think we can filter it through our understanding. Anything that you have from God, you got by revelation. God reveals it. He shows it to you. Why is it that all these churches are embracing all these other books? Because the devil knows the power is in the word, and the word and the spirit agree together. If you don't have the right word, you're not going to have the right spirit. And that's the other problem. Anyway, the Word of God tells us that Satan desired to have Simon to sift him, take him apart, disassemble him, scrutinize him, and get him all figured out for destruction. But then Jesus said, but I prayed for thee. Isn't it awesome to know the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ prayed for us? You might say, when did he personally pray for me? Oh, don't you know? Have you ever read in John chapter 17 the beautiful prayer that Jesus prayed? And then he said, I don't just pray for these that thou hast given me, but for all those who shall believe on my name, those that aren't even born yet, but someday, maybe 2,000 years later, I'm praying for them right now. And I want you to know that that prayer got through, folks. You see, Jesus was both God and man. As God, he answered prayer. As God, he stilled the storm. As God, he raised the dead. As man, he prayed. As man, he wept. As man, he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. And he was so human that he died. And they buried him, but he rose again the third day according to the scripture, giving us the gospel and a way of salvation. But you see, it's the almighty God in the form of man, Emmanuel, God with us. Praise the Lord, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, Colossians 1.19. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Colossians 2, 9 and 10, preceded by verse 8, which says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. The very thing that's happening, the very condition of our day. People being spoiled, sifted, disassembled, taken apart by Satan. And what an awesome thing it is to behold, and a sad thing. And yet, we know we have the prayer of Jesus Christ, prayed for all of those that he selected. After all, he's the shepherd. All of those that he has called out. We have the power of his prayer. Now, notice what he said. He said, but I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. There are some words there that need to be considered very strongly. For one thing, it says that thy faith fail not. It seems kind of strange to see those two words right together, doesn't it? Faith and fail. It almost seems like a... You know, it's almost like putting together an oxymoron. You know what an oxymoron is? Where you have two words that have opposite meanings, you put them together to make a point, point of expression. Uh, we've all heard them like working vacation, right? Pretty ugly, uh, terribly good, military intelligence. Huh? We've, uh, we've all heard of those. And when you put the word faith and fail together, it seems like there's something just kind of jabs at you. What is that talking about? You see, faith is so powerful because it originates in heaven. It's a gift of God, and it is perfect. It is something that the Bible calls in, in Hebrews 11, both substance and evidence. For faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Faith never fails. Faith never fails until it's put in the hands of people. If you had faith as a grain of mustard seed, Jesus said it. He cannot lie. You could say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and it shall obey you. 
It's in the book of God. And yet in our human minds, that's unthinkable. A mountain being plucked up and cast into the sea, how could it be? We don't understand that. Thankfully, faith doesn't require your ability to understand. It just simply says believe. And when you stop and think about what God has said, what he expects of us, it isn't much. All he tells us that we must do is believe him. And if you believe, you will obey. All right? You don't have to understand everything. And anything you don't understand, instead of trying to take that out of the scripture, make it say something else, attribute it to the fact that you are ignorant. Attribute it to your own ignorance. I don't get it. What does that mean? You pray. You seek the Lord. You call upon him. You reach out to him. God will reveal his word, and he will lead you and guide you. But when you start to try to change things around, it's Satan sifting you. You can see he's been sifting. He sifted so much, we've got all kinds of Bible versions out there. Perversions, pardon me. We have numerous religions. No wonder in the book of Jude we read those powerful words. To earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. These ministers get up. I read some of these uh, doctrinal reports from some of these churches. One said God has changed his, the way he operates. God has changed the way he does things. And I know enough about the word of God to realize that he doesn't change. God never changes. You can depend on that. He said, I am the Lord thy God. I change not. Now what could be clearer than that? Jesus Christ the same Yesterday, and today, and forever. All three dimensions of time, and from everlasting to everlasting, thou art the Lord. He never changes at all. What he has written in his word is absolute. God doesn't change his mind. See, the devil's changing all the time and changing things all the time when he can. And everything is in a constant state of instability. But we have the true word of God, and if you don't believe it, you might just as well forget the whole thing. And, you know, years ago, Sam, what I'm saying is we have to have something to hold on to, don't we? What do you hold on to? You might say, my faith? Faith in your hands could fail. It did with Peter. Faith doesn't fail. But Jesus said he prayed for Peter that his faith fail not. Peter's faith, not just faith. Jesus didn't say, I, I prayed for you that faith fail not. He said, your faith fail not. And people fail because they do not allow faith to come and have a perfect work. Faith is something that is visible. It's substance. It's evidence. It's not a concept. The reason it's visible is because it prompts people to do something with it. Faith without works is dead being alone. You know, Jesus one time was in this house, and he was teaching, as his manner was. He was teaching people they needed to hear. And all of a sudden, there's a commotion up above. And there's people up there tearing the roof apart. They tore a big hole in the roof, and they had a man up there that couldn't walk. He was crippled. They got him up on the roof. Now that must have been some kind of a job. They didn't have very good ladders back then, I don't think. I don't think they had any dual, sa dual safety ladders with the little ladder shoes on them and scaffolding or anything. But they got him up on the roof and tore it up, made a hole in it, and lowered him down to where Jesus was because there were so many people they couldn't get him through. There'd be a whole lot of excuse me's to get through there. But anyway, they saw that this was the only way they could get close to Jesus. They tore the roof up, lowered him down right to where Jesus was. The word of God tells us that Jesus healed him, forgave his sins, got the Pharisees all upset because they said, Who is this uh, that speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? That's right. And every Catholic ought to know that too. And every Lutheran minister who stands up and announces the grace of God and says, in the stead of and by the command of the Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Remember? 
Who can forgive sins but God only? He had them all upset. Well, anyway, Jesus looked at the situation, and the Bible says he saw their faith. He saw it. Faith isn't a concept. It becomes something visible. It's a substance of things hoped for. They hoped this man would be healed. It's the evidence of things not seen. They didn't see it yet, but they knew it would happen if they would allow faith to propel them into action and lower this man down, and it worked. The Lord healed him. The Bible says God saw their faith. God sees faith. And faith becomes a testimony to others when it becomes visible. They might think you're absolutely crazy, but it works. It works. Faith causes people to do unusual things by the world's standards. But it works. Amen? 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 And so we understand that Satan's desire is to sift, to destroy. But when Jesus prayed, he prayed that their faith fail not. We need something to hold on to, don't we? You know, years ago, there was this man by the name of Robert Ingersoll. Some of you may have heard of Robert Ingersoll. He went all over the United States, touring around the country, telling people why they shouldn't believe in God. He was Mr. Atheist himself. He preceded Madeline Murray O'Hare, O'Hara, whatever her name was. But anyway, she, of course, she's the famous, infamous atheist. But this man, Robert Ingersoll, went all over the country doing lectures. College professors brought him in. And his lectures were all about how there is no God. It's foolish to believe in God. Religions are all wrong. Religions cause wars and strife and all this. And then he taught his audience a little song. And strangely enough, I don't know how it happened, but it's worked its way into churches. And they sing it. Robert Ingersoll actually wrote the song little chorus. The time to be happy is now, and the place to be happy is here, and the way to be happy is make others happy and have a little heaven down here. In other words, the time to be happy is now, there's nothing later. The place to be happy is here, because there's nowhere else you're going to go. The way to be happy is just make others happy, and have heaven down here by making everybody happy. Everybody do their own thing. Aren't Christians dumb? Huh? They'll pick up anything that sounds good. A song written by an atheist and they're praising God. No, 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 no. When the devil invents something, it's got to stay in his realm. Well, they're so naive, I guess I should say, that they try to Christianize Christmas, Valentine's Day, Easter, pagan holidays. But they're going to fix it up. No, we need to understand what is of God, what is not of God. Now, Robert Ingersoll, after traveling all over the United States for years and years, telling people there is no God, there is no God, there is no God. Of course, they, had the, uh, they also had the writings of Friedrich Wilhelm Nietzsche, Nietzscheism. Remember during the 60s and all the college campuses, God is dead. Everybody's saying, God is dead, God is dead, God is dead. Well, the fact is, he was dead to them. Light is dead to a blind man. Sound is dead to a deaf man. They just showed the condition they were in. One man one time took a big piece of chalk and he wrote on the wall, God is dead, and then wrote the author of that statement, Nietzsche. The German philosopher, Nietzsche, right underneath it. And somebody came along, very cleverly wrote, Nietzsche is dead, God. Hmm. When Ingersoll got to the end of his days, he was laying on the bed dying. His atheistic friends were all around there, all these atheists. Trying to, can you imagine trying to comfort somebody like that? And being comforted by atheists. And they said to 
Ingersoll, they said, Bob, hang on. Hang on, Bob, just hang on. And he turned his head over and looked at them and he said, for a man in my position at a time like this, there's nothing to hang on to. Isn't that something to think about? The dying words of an atheist. There is nothing to hang on to. Slipping and falling and going into hell, nothing to hang on to. Spent his life denying God. Voltaire and his bunch used to go get together for fun. They get in a room, walk in there, shut the door and take a King James Bible, had to be King James, threw it down on the floor and spun their heels on it and kicked it all over the room while they were laughing. But you see, there comes a day when that all comes to an end and eternity is just ahead and then what? We need something to hang on to and faith provides, faith in God, in the Almighty, will provide what you need to get from here to there. Jesus prayed for Peter and said, now when you're strengthened, when you're converted rather, he said then strengthen the brethren. Now let's turn in our Bibles over to another place in Scripture. Just for a moment. We're going to go to Colossians chapter 1. Taking that word strengthened. And it says in the 11th verse, strengthened with all might. Praise God. All might. Why? Because he's the almighty. According to his glorious power, unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. Isn't that great? Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet, or suitable, in other words, to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. That's the work of God in you. He's the one who made that possible. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. Had you noticed that there's darkness out there? Spiritual darkness? And that spiritual darkness is manifesting an infernal power? And people are being deceived? There has never been a time like this. You know... A lot of people have a little glimmer of hope. Next year they can elect a new president, right? Now isn't that an interesting little thing? If you don't want Hillary, that doesn't make any difference who gets in anyway. We know that. They got that figured out already. But if you don't want Hillary, they want everybody to go down and do the little voting thing. They got new machines now. You know, now that the elections have been stolen twice, uh, they, they got these new machines now. If you don't want Hillary or Obama, you could always go with Giuliani, who goes to work and dresses up like a woman. It's pro-abortion. Everything is so muddled up, nobody knows. <clears throat> They're looking at this, and there is nobody. You could put a Mormon in there. They take secret oaths in their temple. Of course, we got a president now who took a secret oath in his temple. Went into the Skull and Bones temple and took a secret oath and laid in a coffin. I'll tell you what, I don't care who says what, I wouldn't vote for anybody that laid in a coffin and did a ritual. And climbed out and sang the Whiff and Poof song. You probably know about that, don't you? Look it up sometime, find the words to that. These lost little sheep called the Skull and Bones members. Ba, 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 it's a mockery. They blaspheme God. The whole world is full of blasphemy because the Bible says in the very last days a beast would rise up out of the sea, Revelation chapter 13, and on the heads of that beast would be the name of blasphemy written right there for all to see. Hollywood is full of blasphemy. The Lips of our children produce blasphemy. People are taught to blaspheme. And they're doing it 
Never has there been a time such as this. Everything is crumbling. War is raging and about to rage with more intensity. And nothing seems to make sense. It's not supposed to. Because there's a spirit of confusion. And Satan always uses confusion. God's not the author of confusion. We understand that. God will give you love and peace and a sound mind. But in a world full of minds that are not sound, a sound mind would seem like an unsound one. It's a little matter of comparative relativity here, isn't there? If everybody around you is insane and you're sane, everybody around you is going to think you're insane because they're all right. It's kind of like the woman who's watching the marching band come down the street and uh, she, her son's marching in the band. She says to a person next to her, look at that. Everybody's out of step except my son. Well, that's how it is. So we are in a time of sifting. If you're wondering what's going on out there, the nations are being sifted. People are being sifted. They're being literally taken apart. No wonder they can't think. <clears throat> but there is faith and hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. We know from what we're reading here in Colossians chapter 1 that we can be strengthened. Because it says in verse 11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power under all patience and longsuffering with joyfulness. Giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Isn't that a glorious thing? Don't you appreciate light? To be able to see and know and understand and identify things. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated, oh, I like this, and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Do you realize that you have already been translated into another kingdom? I have a little trouble with people that go to the ball game and stand there, put their hand over their heart, looking at the flag and sing it a song. doing the second-degree fellow craft masonry salute with a hand over the heart. That's exactly where it came from. Looking at the blue field with the 50 stars on it, just like they had on the, have on the ceilings of the Masonic lodges and just like they had on the ceiling of Nebuchadnezzar's palace. To worship means to give your heart. That's the meaning of the word worship. To give your heart. And I can give my heart to no one but my Savior. You go in churches, they got a flag on one side and a flag on the other. But my banner, my banner is Yahweh in this side. The Lord is my banner. Amen. And so we reach out to him, but to give your heart to anything or anyone. And oh, there's idolatry out there. All of that is idolatry. Where is your heart? Who do you turn to for help in time of need? That's your God. Wherever you go to church, whatever you do, the one you turn to for help, the one you trust and believe in, put all your faith in, that's your God. Whether it be man or the systems of men, or whether it be the promises of this book. That's what we have to determine and identify. Who is your Lord and, and Savior? Who is he? All right?
And so the Word of God tells us here that we are strengthened with all might according to the glorious po His glorious power, unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. We have been delivered if we're converted. Some people say, oh, I've been converted, just haven't been delivered yet. Then you're not converted. I get these letters from people. Oh, my son, my daughter, you know, from these mothers. I accepted the Lord when they're eight years old. They accepted the Lord, but now they're out there doing dope and running around uh, with uh, all kinds of fornication and stuff going on. But they're Christians. They're just into this. They're not Christians. Let's identify what a Christian is. And if we do that, we'll find there are almost no Christians. One who is Christ-like. And with that definition, go home and look in the mirror and say, I am a Christian. Or try this one, I am a saint. And see if it has a hollow ring to it. You understand what I'm saying? We work out our salvation with fear and trembling. We are fighting an enemy who wants to sift us like wheat. And our only hope for success is the hand of the Almighty coming down with the power of the Holy Ghost. And if we deny the Holy Ghost, you have no power. You will be sifted. And you will fall along with all the other things sifted out. who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son. Isn't that awesome? In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. What's that worth to you? What's it worth to you right now? The forgiveness of sins. What would it be worth to you on judgment day? It should be worth that right now. But you know, because of the effect of this world on us, we sometimes fail. Not faith, we fail to understand and to realize the greatness of our salvation. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Salvation is not something to neglect. It's a matter of purpose. It's a matter of holy purpose and the greatest of our desires. That is, to be right with God. To do what pleases Him. Who is the image of the invisible God, who is Jesus Christ, in whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. He was before all things. That's why he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, because God does not know the confinement of time. The Lord dwells in eternity, including the little piece of eternity marked off and calibrated as time. God inhabits all three dimensions of time simultaneously. You and I have to crawl along one step at a time. Amen? That's one of the things that makes him God and you people. That's one of the differences. We move through time. God inhabits it and occupies it all together because he preceded it, and when time is gone, he's still the I am. Verse 16 says, for by him, I love this, it says, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and Invisible, invisible things, yes. One man, one time, atheist. I don't believe in atheists. They say they're atheists, but I don't believe in them. I think way deep down inside they know. They won't admit it. This atheist said, I don't believe in anything I can't see. Well, my Christian friend said, do you believe you have a brain? And he said, well, sure. And he said, have you seen it? <clears throat> I 
For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And all of these thrones or seats of authority or offices of authority, including that Masonic oval office in the White House, patterned after Babylon, with all the Egyptian and Babylonian symbols surrounding it, including the obelisk and, and the uh, reflecting pool. You know, I still, I think back sometimes, and I, I just look back and, and think of things that I've seen, places I've been. I've been to Washington, D.C. twice. And I've walked near that big reflecting pool where the big obelisk is and the shadow was cast over the pool and so forth. And I remember in 1999 on New Year's Eve when they had the, the big obelisk all fixed up, the Washington Monument, and had a big number 1999 in red on there. And the cameras for the television were situated such that the one was missing. You couldn't see the one. You could only see 999 in red. And in the reflecting pool, it showed as a 666. Then at midnight, when this obelisk, this phallic symbol, a reproduction of that, that uh, phallus of Baal, that reproductive organ of Baal, that's what it is, 555 feet high, at midnight, Bill Clinton set the fireworks off, and the light show began, and there was this pulsating light climbing that shaft up to the top, and, and fireworks and so forth, a very lewd and filthy display. What do you know what it means? But what shocked me is all the people, in now we're talking December 31st, it's winter, it's cold out, and all these people come running down and jump into that reflecting pool to be in the light of that shadow of the obelisk. What spirit prompted them to jump in frigid water and get all wet, far from home, and to be under the shadow of that Egyptian symbol representing the sun god? What spirit would do that? Was it an impulse? Yeah. But it was an impulse prompted by some spirit. And I think we have a, an understanding of why they did it. They did that in old Egypt. Pharaoh's daughter, when she found Moses, was down there in ritual bathing in the Nile River in the presence of all those symbols and so forth that they had put up. That was done as a ritual. And there she found Moses crying, laying in a basket. And Miriam, his sister, saw Pharaoh's daughter, the princess of Egypt, take this little one. She went over and said, are you going to keep the baby? And, of course, it became known that, yeah, I'm going to keep this little baby. Because her heart was immediately, you know, God can touch hearts. Her heart was just totally smitten by that little baby crying. Moses means drawn out of the water. And little Miriam said, I'll find you a nurse to take care of him for you. Went and got the baby's own mother. God had a way to moving, of moving her into a palace. And a good thing because that little boy grew up as a prince in Egypt and was taught all the ways of Egypt, all the ways of Mithraism, all the mysteries of Egypt, all of the, the, things, the secret things of Freemasonry, which date back to Egypt. But every day or every night, whenever it happened, his real mother would tell him about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the creator of the world. And he knew both sides. And when he got old enough, the Bible says that he chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And God raised him up. And through a series of incidents, he ended up in a desert speaking with a burning bush and came back empowered after he had been to the fire 
the Spirit of God, he was able to go into Egypt and do a work that he was sent to do. Praise the Lord. Oh, yes, the Lord has a way of empowering us. But notice what it says here in Colossians chapter 1, if you go down to verse 17. Yes, all things were created by him and for him. Verse 17 says, and he is before all things. Are you ready for this? And by him all things consist. That word consist means held together. God holds all things together. Now, look at atoms for an example. What holds the neutrons and protons together to form a nucleus around which all the electrons orbit at such a speed that it's a blur, a vibration? That's God. Holds the smallest of things together. The little atoms are held together. You know, those electrons are so close together in their different shells or rings... K, L, M, and N, and so forth. That's why gold doesn't tarnish. The, the N ring is so tight that nothing can get through it. But electrons are all negatively charged. Why don't they fly apart? A like charges repel. They should all fly apart, but they don't. They hold together, forming all of the elements that God created and that Dmitry Mendeleev put together in the form of a periodic table. But it's, all of this is held together by God. What causes the earth to hang on nothing? It's hanging on nothing. God asked that question. Where are the ropes? Where are the wires? Remember he's talking to Job? What's the earth hanging on? Why is the earth tilted 23 and a half degrees, giving us our four seasons? And the lights in the heavens are for times and seasons and days and years and so forth. Why does the earth orbit around the sun every 365 days, 5 hours, 48 minutes, and 46 seconds? Why is it so precise? Why? It's the word of God that makes it consist, that holds it together. But the real joy of all of this is knowing that if God holds you together, if by him you consist, then Satan can't sift you or take you apart. His sifter won't work on you. Because you don't come apart. You can't be disassembled. <clears throat> Amen. By him all things consist. You know, when we see things being shaken, and that's really, sifting also can be defined as a shaking. In fact, the... the uh, the Hebrew word over in Amos 9.9 9, where God said he would sift the nations, that means to shake. As a great shaking. And everything that can be shaken will be shaken, but we have received a kingdom which cannot be removed. Now, we have to move on while I have a little time left. I want to go back a little bit here to Ephesians chapter 6. In Ephesians chapter 6, We are told this. We're going to go down to verse uh, <clears throat> 10. Ephesians 6.10, the Apostle Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, said, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. Folks, I'll tell it to you just like he told it to them. Be strong in the Lord. You can do it. Because by him all things consist. Amen. And in the power of his might. His might. As God said through the prophet, it's not by might and it's not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. By his spirit, by his might, you will consist, you will not come apart at the seams. Do you ever hear people use that expression? I'm just coming apart at the seams. Sometimes it seems like you're just totally just come. Well, that's Satan trying to sift you. But once the Lord's got a hold of you, you don't sift very easily. In fact, when you start to feel sifted, you're prompted to call out to the Almighty and he'll take.
take care of that in short order. Amen? I'll illustrate that for you in a couple of minutes. But first, uh, he says in verse 11, Put on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. His trickery. He works in very, the devil works in very, very strange ways. Because he has such a variety of ways to move people into action one way or another. He's got, it's been said the devil will treat you so many ways you're bound to like one of them. But the word says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles. The trickery of the devil, as it, or schemes, you might say. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Well, you know, for some people, that verse consists only of four words. For we wrestle not, because they don't fight. I think that the majority of churches called Christian, that call themselves Christian, or want to be thought of as Christian, have stopped fighting the devil. And once you stop fighting the devil, you start cooperating with him. There is not, you cannot be stationary. There is no middle ground. Either you're fighting him or you're cooperating with him. And that's why we see the general deterioration in all of these organizations, and we see that the fruit that's coming forth is producing destruction. But we do wrestle if we know our God. We're in a fight. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Secrets everywhere. Secrets, secrecy. I once asked a powerful wizard, a witch down in Madison, years ago, I walked in his shop to do some battle. It was on Willie Street at the time. It's not there anymore. We saw to that. Prayer removes things, folks. I've been working out in the warehouse here, the garage out here. We keep all of our supplies. It's about half full of... We, you wouldn't believe how many envelopes we've got. And, and tapes and Bibles and... But anyway, I was out there sorting through because we're doing some cleaning and I found all these papers I'm saving from articles from New York when we used to go on our prayer walks. At one time, Shirley and I walked from 50, 50, 51st Street down to 34th. And 33 days later, the street blew up. Fifth Avenue blew up. That whole stretch blew up. I got pictures of it. And cars were sunken in and a black top was lifted up. I'll show them to you sometime. I'm going to put together a little presentation. But one after another, buildings crumbling, falling, crumbling, falling, crumbling, falling. And finally, Giuliani said, the city is not falling apart. 33 buildings collapsed. I got pictures of them. And they said, well, that's just old age. Why right within that time frame? What's a falling building a sign of? What did Jesus say? How about the falling of the Tower of Siloam? What did he say about that? He said, do you think these men were sinners above all other men because this Tower of Siloam, the 42 men that it fell on, because it fell on them? He said, nay, but I say unto thee, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Falling buildings are a sign of perishing people who refuse to repent. That's why God uses it. People don't pray enough. You know, the landscape has changed. Driving down West Wash years ago, I looked at Hotel Washington, Club de Wash, and all that. Michael Feldman, uh, the filthy entertainer that worked in there, and all that. It's a homosexual, it was a homosexual hotel, and I asked the Lord to just send the fire of Sodom against it. I didn't even know it was coming out of my mouth. The Lord was prompting me. Drove on past a few days later, I, th I think it was 10, uh, 10 days or so. I didn't keep track of that one, but had the radio on. They said it burned to the ground. Went down there and drove past, nothing but a hole. 
That's what it was before. But now it's just a hole in the ground. And it was gone. People have written to me and said, it works. We prayed and asked God, close this abortion clinic. And it went. Come on. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. We're wrestling against devils, evil spirits, satanic princes. But we do not fear. It's not us. We're just being used by God. We yield to him and he does it. It's not us. But they do come down, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. They used to go down, this still worked to be done, believe me, but they used to go down to State Street and go up and out, just down there last Friday again, walk down to the end and back. And These little prayer walks are nice. You know, I sat down, I used to sit down in front of this place. They have these benches, you know, these metal benches out on the street. And uh, they had this, some kind of adult arcade thing there. Sit down on the bench and just pray, Lord, close up this hole. Lord, bring it down, power the blood of Jesus, and, and just pray there. And every, every time I get down there, I'd sit there and just do that. And uh, all of a sudden, I went down there one day to pray against it, and there was a for rent sign in the window. The place was gone. Now there's a pizza place in there. That we can probably handle. I don't know, but uh, uh, that's what it is now. I don't think I'd go in there just because of what it once was. I don't know how long it takes to get the bacteria out of there, but no, I don't know. It's, it's just uh, it's amazing what the Lord will do. But what do you think it means when he said we wrestle not against flesh and blood? We do wrestle, but it's with these spiritual powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day. Are we in it? Is this an evil day? Then we better put it on. And having done all to stand, when you've done all that you can do, what do you do then? Do you fall at the last? No, you stand. Because if you put forth all of your effort in obedience to God, he will be there to sustain you. If you live for God easy, it's hard, but if you live for God hard, it's easy. It can be done. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench how many? All the fiery darts of the wicked, all of them. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. What do we know about that sword? It's quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It'll pierce and divide asunder right down to the marrow. It'll discern the thoughts and the intents of the heart, won't it? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying always, watch this now, with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Some people have never prayed in the Spirit. They've used words. They've manufactured words. They've made sentences, maybe even paragraphs of prayer. But they've never prayed in the Spirit. And watching thereunto with all perseverance. So that's an endurance, isn't it? And supplication for all saints. And for me that utterance may be given unto me. That I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. And he goes on to say he's an ambassador in bonds for that very purpose. So praise the Lord. What can we do? If we put on the whole armor of God, we will find, we will do exploits in his name. Now, I have one more thing to do before I close, and I need to take you back to the Old Testament for a couple of minutes. I'm known to use up all of my minutes, and I've got eight left, and I'm going to use them. Praise the Lord. If we go back to 1 Samuel chapter 17, we find there's a war going on. And it's a bad one. It's a bad one because 
Israel is being humiliated. If you recall, Saul disobeyed the Lord time and again, and at one point he went too far. He tried to offer sacrifices, which only a priest could do. Now Saul, king of Israel, was the tallest man in Israel, and he had a little element of pride that kind of got to him. And we know that Saul the king was a prophet. He prophesied. He was a king. He was anointed to be king. And when he tried to offer a sacrifice, that also would have made him a priest, and God didn't allow it. Because there is only one man, as long as the world would exist, who could be all three, prophet, priest, and king. You will find men who were kings and prophets, who were prophets and priests, but you never found all three other than Jesus Christ. When Saul tried to do that, he became an anti-Christ. And once David was anointed, the least likely to succeed in his family, well, they treated him with contempt, didn't they? The little shepherd boy? He was kind of laughable, you know. Big brothers. None of them were anointed, but God said, that's the one right there, look at the heart. I'm not looking at the biceps, triceps, quadriceps, and all the other seps and concepts, but I'm looking at the heart. That little shepherd boy is a man after my own heart. He had a heart of God in him. In other words, his emotions lined up with God's heart. He had faults, yes. He was human, yes. But the way his heart operated, he loved those sheep. And he was, he'd heard about this war. His brothers were out there supposedly fighting in it, but nobody was doing any fighting. They were cowering before Goliath. I won't have time to read all this. I'm going to kind of tell it to you. You can read it on your own. But here he was. His father sent him out with some lunches for the boys. And he got off his wagon, and right about that time, Goliath came out. This big Man of war, nine feet, six and one half inches tall, nearly ten feet tall. And with all the skill any man of war could possibly have. There he was, challenging not only Israel, but God himself. Now that's something very important to remember. And I'll tell you why in a minute. But here were all these people of Israel, and they were all cowering before this giant. Nobody wanted to, fire, to, to fight him. He said, bring out your best man, and I'll fight him. And if I win, the Philistines take your whole kingdom. If he wins, then you have our kingdom. Nobody would go. Saul wouldn't face him. Remember... Saul lost everything he had because the Bible says the Lord departed from him and an evil spirit came unto him. And I'll tell you, I don't know about you, but if the Lord departed from any of us, we'd be afraid to face the devil. Maybe you're afraid to face him now and you shouldn't be. Not because of who you are, because of who the Lord is. If you fear the devil, you've worshipped him. And that's one of his strongest weapons, is to put fear in you, if he can do it. Your battle is with fear, because if you can eliminate and conquer all fear, faith is no problem. Faith and fear don't work together. They don't exist in the same place at the same time. That your faith... Fail not. Faith cannot fail. But in your hands, it can, if you don't know what to do. And if you don't know where to put your trust and adoration and confidence. Here was David. He was looking at this situation. Here was this giant thundering his challenge, and nobody moved. And the men stood around instead, and they said, Oh, boy, if we could just find somebody. 
that would go, why that man, he could, it says right in here, they're talking among each other. Why that man could be rich, the king would give him riches, he could marry the king's daughter. And, goes on to say, his house would be free, meaning he wouldn't have to ever pay taxes again. What does that tell you about being free? Are any of us free? Everybody would want that, providing the king's daughter was fairly decent looking, that would be, you know, but I'm just saying. It means he would have an inheritance of the king's wealth, never have to pay taxes, and be given a lot of money. But nobody would move. Everybody was frozen in their place because that spirit of fear came out of Goliath's mouth. Now David looked at that. He said, I'll go. What's, what's going? How come nobody went yet? And they thought he was ridiculous. And the king finally called for him when he heard about it. Here was little David, not even old enough to shave. And you're going to go out there and fight that giant? He said, is there not a cause? And Saul said, you can't go. And he said, let me tell you something. He said, I was taking care of my flock, and a lion came and took one of the sheep in its mouth and ran, and I went after it. And I smote the lion and took that little sheep out of its mouth. And another time a bear came, and I felt the anointing of God come over me, and I went out there, and I went after that bear, and I took that lamb away from the bear and smote it. He said, now I'm feeling that anointing coming on me again. That anointing I felt with the lion, with the bear, now I feel it coming again. And here's this giant, and he's going to fall like they did. What did this guy have? This young man. They tried to put the armor on him. He just sunk down under the weight of him. He said, I can't wear this. He just took his staff and his sling, went, went out and found five smooth stones by the brook Kidron, Little river rocks. Five of them. You know why he took five? Because later on, when you read your Bible, you'll find out Goliath had four brothers. He was not going to just get the one. He was going to nail all five of them while he was at it. He didn't get the chance to then, but they got him later. Of course, Goliath is mocking him and laughing at him. You can see a type of Christ hanging on the cross there with Satan and all those jeering and laughing. and Everyone forsook him and fled. The people of Israel were absolutely paralyzed. Jesus hung there alone, just as David stood alone that day and took that rock and he used his sling and there was only one place in the armor of Goliath that, uh, had, where there's a little break, right in the forehead. It was the only place unprotected. And that's right where the rock went because God guided it and it sunk into his head and down he came. And David ran over there and stood on top of him, took his sword out and cut his head off. I'm telling you something, that was victory that day for that entire nation. They were paralyzed in fear, but one young man with the anointing of God took care of the job because God moved upon him to do it. It takes the spirit. What was David saying? Now this is very important. He didn't say, look what that giant is saying to Saul. Look what that giant is doing to me. He said, look what he's doing to us. Look what he's doing to the God of Israel. When the devil starts to come after you to sift you as wheat, you need to bring the Lord into it. Say, Lord, look what that devil's trying to do to me, to us. Not just me, to you, to us. Look what he's trying to do to us. Bring God into it. When you go home, don't ever feel alone because you're not. You go home or go to work or go wherever you go and you run into conflicts with devils. Say, Lord, look what the devil's trying to do to us. Here you are standing there by yourself. That's the way David looked at it. How dare that man defy the armies of the living God. And when he got out near that giant, he ran that. He, think of this. He ran by himself, no armor that was visible. By himself, he ran at the giant, at his four brothers, and an entire army of armed Philistines. He ran straight into them with his sling. 
Jesus hung on the cross in the face of every enemy and won the victory and spoiled the strong man's house just like David cut off Goliath's head with his own sword. Goliath's sword. And the strong man was destroyed at Calvary. And we're set free and we can shout about it and praise God about it because Satan cannot sift us. Because by the Lord and by his power, we consist. We hold together. We cannot be taken apart. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. You shall tread on serpents and adders. The Bible says you can tread on serpents and adders, meaning devils. Remember that early flag in our country? They had the snake on the blue field that said, don't tread on me. God says, you better tread on it. We had so much antichrist stuff in this country from the very outset of it. If people know what to look for. But folks, we are held together by faith in God. And our faith will not fail because the Lord holds us together. Amen. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we thank thee, Lord, because we know thy word is true and we can rest in the certain hope that thou art with us. But Lord, I pray that thou wouldst empower us. Let faith, O Lord, overcome. O Lord, that we might glorify thee with it. For our faith will not fail because it's a gift from thee and we are held together by the blood of Jesus. Let there be no fear in our lives, but help us to walk in peace with thee. No matter what happens and how much is going on around us, we can walk in the assurance of peace. We can be still in the Holy Ghost and walk in the light, O Lord, while darkness abounds and is everywhere. For thou art our Savior and our King, the light of the world. And thy word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Be thou with us, O God, and empower us by thy Spirit that we might be in thy perfect will and rise up above every circumstance to bring glory to thy name. Guide us and direct us, Lord. Let thy Spirit come into this place in a powerful way to heal, to strengthen, to save to the uttermost. We yield ourselves unto thee, O God. Let thy will be done. Let Satan be rebuked and unable to hinder us in any way. And we ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus, through the power of the blood. Amen. Glory to God.